can get going now. Um, my name's Mitch, and I uh, guess I've met most of you before, but this is my contact information uh, here. Uh, so feel free, please feel free to contact me anytime for any reason. I love helping people any way I can. And um, in China, uh, you know, all over people are uses, you know, Telegram and Facebook, Facebook Messenger and Hangouts and all these different things. And in and, and China, everyone uses WeChat. Everyone. If they can afford a smartphone, they use WeChat. So that's my WeChat ID. If you're ever in China, uh, you'll need that too. And, um, but I keep it going all the time because I go to China uh, for a month or two or three sometimes every year and I've been doing that since 2003 uh, and I'm in contact with people from China all the time and from going there every month um, well every year for at least a month I have my own warped perspectives of what goes on in China and I'm not necessarily correct, but uh, it seems to resonate even with people in China. So I, I like sharing this stuff. And China does have a lot to offer. Um, so uh, I do want to start off, since you're a captive audience, uh, with this slide, because I like, like, like promul uh, ranting about this. So <clears throat> I am a happy worker. Most people on our planet are not happy workers. When we think of a worker, we usually think of someone toiling away doing something they don't even want to do and they're only doing it because they're getting, hopefully, enough money in order to buy food and shelter. And they're spending so much time doing all these things that are just so, at best, uh, uh, innocuous, uh, things that aren't helping each other but not hurting each other, but so many things we do for work are actually hurting ourselves and the people around us and even the planet. So I think it's really important that we find a way to get the resources we need in our lives um, in a way that's good for us and hopefully good for the people around us <clears throat> and even good for the planet. Because um, we spend a third of our lives at work. A third, you know, like eight to 10 to 12 hours a day. If you're in Silicon Valley, they expect you to come on weekends and, uh, and then we sleep eight hours a day. And if you're like the average American who watches an average of six and a half hours of screen time every day, when do you have time to even explore, let alone do something that you feel is worthwhile? So, but um, I actually turn TVs off for a living and I like my job. So uh, I invented this keychain called TV Be Gone. Um, and I started selling them in 2004. And um, I didn't do it to make money, I just did it because I fucking hate TV. I'm a TV addict, I watched TV every waking moment of my childhood, I was totally depressed, I tried to escape life into it, and it took over my life. And as an adult, I learned I can quit, I can actually explore and try things that I actually love doing and learn to live a life I love. But when they started popping up everywhere in public places, you know, I got rid of them for my apartment, TV. I got rid of TV from my apartment in 1980. And somewhere around the early 90s, they started popping up everywhere in public. Can you imagine that the world at one point did not have TVs everywhere you look? It's kind of hard to imagine at this time because every pub, every restaurant and cafe, every airport, every train station, and on and on schools. So um, anyways, when I started seeing them everywhere, I couldn't do anything about them. But I am a geek, so I, I knew that I could create a remote control to turn them all off, so I did. And it turned out that other people liked that idea, oddly enough. And since 2004, when I started selling them, um, I've sold a half a million of them. <laughs> and it's the only way that me and 12 friends have made money for the last 13 years. Yeah. So and it was just because I explored and found some things I like. This was one of them, and it really took over a big chunk of my psyche. And I was obsessed with it. And uh, it turned out other people liked it too, because you know, if just think about all the cool things you do. If if you come up with something that you really are obsessed with and love, chances are other people find meaning in that as well. 
And if, if people find meaning in you doing something, those are the kind of things that people might pay you to do. And maybe you could make a living doing the cool thing that you think is, you know, just totally awesome. So um, this actually does tie into what I want to talk about, which is um, uh, really like hacker spaces and the whole hacker maker scene in China and about what China has to offer, um, you know, each of us. You know, China is this amazing place. Of course, it has a big central government, and as all central, big central governments go, it's it's not really there for the benefit of its people. But um, unlike like my country, uh, people, and and in many places in Europe, people in China actually do get some interesting things from their government. My government, when I just give them my tax money, and they blow up people in other countries. So um, anyways, uh, doing TV Be Gone got me invited to um, my first hacker conference and um, it changed my life forever in so many ways, but finding my first hacker conference was totally amazing because here's a place, like here, here's like 100, 150 people who are here who have things they really love doing don't necessarily have time to do it all the time, but when we're here, we're sharing enthusiastically all these things that we love doing with each other and learning from each other. And, un and it's really high because of that, and that's one of the reasons I think we're all here. Um, sadly, that's not what it's like in society at large, where most people, as I said earlier, are just toiling away at some activity that other people are paying them to do, hopefully enough so they can get some food and shelter, so they can live their lives. Um, after the conference is over, you have to go back into that world and then wait for the next conference. My third hacker conference was Chaos Computer Camp in 2007, and there was a talk, amongst all the other cool things, there was a talk about how to start your own hacker space. And I thought that was really an amazing idea because then maybe we don't have to wait till the next hacker conference just to be surrounded by people who really love what they do. We can have a community all day, all night, all year round of people encouraging each other to explore and do things that are really cool, that are really wonderful, that we find meaning in doing. And uh, that inspired me to start NoiseBridge and some other people who were at Chaos Communications Camp 2007 started NYC Resistor and Hack DC in, uh, NYC Resistor in New York City, uh, Hack DC in Washington DC, and um, Hacktory in Philadelphia. We all helped each other, and other, within a year there were a whole bunch of uh, other people who had been watching this, within a year there were 100 new hacker spaces. Within a year after that, there were 500 more. And we still keep helping each other, and it's just really amazing. And we get together just with this idea that we're going to enjoy it. And even if they're doing something as simple as soldering, like these people are doing, <laughs> look how happy they are. That's what happens when people come together just wanting to share what they do and enjoy the time together. Um, but anyways, this all grew. Teaching soldering at NoiseBridge was just a handful of people. I've been doing it every Monday since 2007, and it just grows. And now I can do up to like 50-some people at a time, whatever, big, small, it doesn't matter, as long as we're sharing something that's meaningful for us. And uh, But going to these things, it started getting me invited to go all over the place. Um, I started, uh, of course, manufacturing um, is much less expensive in China, as we all probably know. I tried to manufacture in China, uh, in the US locally, but the price was three times as much and the quality was about half as much. Not a good combination. So I found people in China who could do it for me for really good quality, for a really good price, who treated their people well, paid them well, and treated the environment well. It was not easy to find that in 2003 when I was doing that, but it was possible and I did that. And the difference between that company and the cheapest company I could find was 25 cents per unit. And I thought it was worth paying 25 cents per unit in order to treat people well. If I'm making this thing to make lives better for people, I don't want to do that at the expense of others, right? So anyways, um, China is one of the places I was going. I've been giving talks all around the world and workshops. People started asking me to do that in China. Of course, I'm talking about hackerspaces because they're awesome. And the more I did that, 
the more people in China ask me to do that. And other people start talking about hackerspaces in China. Some people open hackerspaces in China. There's some really cool ones there. And there's all these people talking about hackerspaces in China. And it filters up to local governments who see all the benefits of hackerspaces for uh, economic de development and also for education, and, uh, and they tell their superiors, and it eventually filtered all the way up to the top of government, and I've got a picture for that too. Um, so anyways, you know, doing workshop tours all over the planet, including China. This is the first Maker Faire kind of thing there, called a Maker Carnival in 2012, and doing manufacturing um, in China. Uh, this is my first company. And I met all of these people and with my pigeon Mandarin could kind of talk to them. And they're actually really cool people and they make enough money from one three month um, contract to pay for their living and their family for the rest of the year. And they're allowed up to two contracts per year so they actually get a bunch of extra money and it's pretty cool um, at this place. Other places aren't so good. Um, yeah, and, and then... Um, yeah, just you know, a little taste of the manufacturing testing is kind of weird because they've all, these people have all used remote controls before, but they never did that at work. But here they are testing TV Be Gone at the end of the assembly line, and of course it does work. And uh, and then after that they package it. And um, this is my new company, and this was when I was in China just uh, like three months ago, making the latest batch of TV Be Gones that has includes all of the latest. Uh, off codes for all the new TVs out there. And uh, my new company is much smaller and more responsive to the needs of me and my small company. Um, so um, anyways, here's the first big talk I gave. This was one of the, the sort of the make magazine kind of of China called Gua Ke. And um, they invited me to the Panasonic Center and it was standing room only and I'm talking about hacker spaces and talking about things in ways Chinese people really don't like to hear, uh, uh, which makes people pay attention to me because like, oh, there's this white guy there. He's saying weird things. Come on, check it out. And, and it works. And this grew from like just talking to university students and, and um, uh, little kids at school to things like this and then talking to, this was uh, in October, talking to um, 1,200 bureaucrats. <laughs> and the translator was doing a terrible job, and I could tell because when I would say something, uh, they just had blank faces. And uh, they didn't laugh, and they didn't look surprised when I said death. <laughs> and Chinese people hate wearing, hearing that word. So, um, but anyways, I think they kind of got the idea of what I was trying to say, because afterwards people actually were asking me questions that were worthwhile. But um, this stuff really did filter. It's a huge part of the Chinese government pushing what they call maker education and the maker movement or even the hacker movement um, and it, it filtered all the way up to the top of government and here is the head of state premier li visiting a hacker space uh, started by the um, person who runs seed studio that's with three e's it's a first open hardware company in china and they opened up a hacker space so that people could like get opportunities from them. And Premier Lee visits it and makes this huge media show out of um, the whole thing and says, this, Hackerspaces, is the future of China. You know, and not to let be left behind um, <laughs> the president of my country at the time, not nearly as bad as the current one, uh, <laughs> created the White House Maker Fair. <laughs> and he's looking at this marshmallow launcher. <laughs> that this incredibly cool geeky kid um, created, uh, Joey Hootie. So um, yeah, hackerspaces, I'm talking about hackerspaces. Uh, all of us here probably know it, so I won't harp on this, but hackerspaces really are about community. It's about community. It's not about making a thing. Making a thing is really cool, and we can all make things. It's really wonderful, and we have fun doing that, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's important, and that's what brings us together, but we're there as a community to encourage people to explore and try things and learn and share with each other. And 
you know, when people do that, again, like, here's some people soldering. I mean, that's what I do, right? I like soldering. And, and look, they're happy. <laughs> And um, people come together, and when they come together in this community and they do want to make some things, of course they want tools, and it can be all sorts of different tools. This is one in Ann Arbor, Michigan that does things all mechanical, and they do amazing mechanical things, big and small, and they've got all the tools to do that. And um, I want to say what my definition of hacking is, because you know most people in the world, including China, um, when they hear the word hacker or hacking, they think of people who break into other people's computers and steal shit. That's what the mainstream media called people doing that in the 1990s, and that's what they still call it. So, But as it was defined by the Model Train Club, in MIT in 1953, before most people even heard of computers, hacking is taking resources, devoting it to your project, using those resources any way you want to make your projects cool, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and then sharing it with others. And doing that overall because it's incredibly enjoyable. We all love doing that stuff. And, um, Oh, there's that one. And we do it because it's, it's totally wonderful. We love doing that. And it really is more than just doing things in a certain way. It's a way of... I guess the battery's out. So um, I think I can talk loud. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So um, it's really a way of looking at things. It's a way of living. It's a, a way of being. And... Um, and uh, when you do this, you might find things that you really love, and other people probably... If you do this, you'll probably find things you love, and then chances are good that other people might love it too, and then you can have an idea then for a startup that isn't stupid. I don't know if you've noticed, but like close to 100% of all the startups are stupid. That's because the first thing they think of is, ha, I'm going to get rich. <laughs> How am I going to get rich? I'll do a startup. Uh, what should the startup be about? Oh, people are doing apps. I'll make an app. Yeah, it'll be orange. Whatever. Um, but, you know, if you explore and find things you love, other people might love it too, and then you might find an opportunity, and then you can start a startup that isn't stupid. You don't need to do that when you hack. You absolutely don't need to do that. But if you want to do anything entrepreneurial, you definitely have to start by hacking. You have to ex make time and then explore and find things. And so all good entrepreneurs are good hackers. To be a good hacker, you can do so many different things. Being a good entrepreneur is just one thing you could do. So this excites bureaucrats. Um, of course, anything can be hacked electronics, computers, and all these things. We think of it with art and science and craft and, uh, you know, ourselves. I learned to be uh, a person who loves living my life, starting from a total depressed blob of a kid. The first half of my life was f awful. But I learned to live a life I love by hacking my life. We can hack our communities, our societies, and the planet, and everything needs to be hacked because everything needs people like us and pretty much everyone to join in and teach and share and learn and, and see things in this way that we can share our resources and help our poor little planet out and our people and other beings on it. So anyways, there are a bunch of tools, anything from electronics and fabrication and little hand tools and art and there's art class at Noisebridge, um, cooking, there's lots and lots of wonderful cooking going on in unique and novel ways and even wonderful traditional ways. And it's for people of all ages, it's for everybody on our planet, race and age and um, everything, it doesn't matter. And this is what makes hackerspaces fantastic learning environments because people explore, they're courage to explore, they find things they love. Once you find a project you love, you're super motivated to make it as awesome as possible, so you learn what you need in order to make it as awesome as possible, and you're motivated to learn those things, unlike at schools, where you're only doing it because you're told you have to. Um, so, um, but overall, there are supportive communities for people to explore and do what people really find meaning in doing. And this is how innovative things come about. Innovation is a buzzword now. 
bureaucrats are primed to hear that word. If you use that word along with the word creativity and economic development and education, then maybe they'll even let go of some currency and let some people who actually want to do something worthwhile do those worthwhile things. And I found this works incredibly well in China, but in many places around the world. So when people explore and do things that they really want to do, they're doing things that are perfect for them, and if it's perfect for them, it's probably perfect for the people in their surrounding community. And um, that's something that, again, maybe there's opportunity in that, but it's, it's unique. It's something really cool, and these are just people working on drones in um, um, Magdeburg. Um, but yeah, it's perfect for your community, and maybe it's good for uh, starting a startup that isn't stupid. Um, so China, back to China, and all that stuff applies to talking to bureaucrats in China. Um, there's a lot of stuff in every country, especially one that's been around for two and a half millennia without a break. Um, it has a lot to offer not only the people there, but the world. Um, but there's some economic problems there that they're facing. Uh, the biggest economic game so far there has been uh, Western companies going there and paying Chinese manufacturers to make things for the Western companies that are then shipped halfway around the world. Well, the Chinese, that brought the Chinese economy from almost feudal up to one of the biggest economies in the world uh, in a very short amount of time. And with that, there's a rising middle class, there's a strong economy there. People, of course, are demanding and should be paid much more. So labor costs are much higher now. And also, their economy is doing better, so the exchange rate is going the wrong way for Westerners to go over there and be economical. Energy prices keep going up, so shipping costs halfway around the world are higher. All of that adds up to things not going too well economically. Also, like everywhere in the world, their education system is really problematic. They have been doing examinations there for over a thousand years, and they're hyper-focused on getting the best test scores so they can get into the best kindergarten. And if they're good in kindergarten, they can do the best test scores to get into the best primary schools and secondary schools and universities. Like the university that I'm often helping with education there to turn it into more project-based, two million people apply every year and they only accept 2,000. There's a lot of competition. It's really intense and they focus only on the test and not about learning and it's gotten so bad that there are these cram schools now that train people into not thinking when they're learning and taking these tests. Because if you think, you take more time per question and if you take more time per question, you don't do as well as the people who don't think. So they're training a generation of people to not think. Not a good situation. <clears throat> so. People who run the show there, all these people really want to make things better and they're seeing hackerspaces as a way of doing that. Um, but anyways, um, you know, this is what could happen in the eyes of bureaucrats and they don't want to see that happen and when there are um, problems to solve, there are opportunities and China with a billion people and all the manufacturing and all the parts and materials coming from China and an education system, even if it's focused on tests, there's a lot of resources there to use for them and the world. But some things need to shift in China because they've been focusing on these tests for so long, like I said, that that's become problematic. Creativity is really scary there because there, failure is scary everywhere. But there, if you fail, even if you don't do something perfect, it's so shameful. People are afraid of even trying something without knowing they're going to be really good at it. And they can't be really good if they're first starting because when you first start, you suck. You have to spend 10,000 hours doing it and then you become great. And if you love it, then you become really great. Um, so anyways, all of these things need a little bit of a shift and that's why they were calling for outsiders like me and other people to go in there and talk crazy talk. And it seems to resonate and a lot of people there are ready and all it needs is some weirdo to come along just poke. And people have permission and hackerspace starts. 
and they start all over the place. And it's been really cool to see these things happen. And um, like, um, uh, once there's people uh, exploring and finding cool things, then finding ideas that might be worthwhile for a startup and they might have some uh, possibility of success as a result, uh, then we can have a co-working space where people can bring their little company into reality and even get training for specific things for their company and that's what incubators are for, trading some equity for that training. And um, China is looking to this as part of their future. And same with economically depressed areas in the United States and in Europe. Um, and I'll just poke at education again because most of us experience education that looks more like this. And it's all become about tests. And tests aren't learning. If you learn to do well on a test, that means you're a good test taker. That school in China, the one I mentioned is called Tsinghua, they are the best test takers in the planet. <clears throat> if you ask one of those people, okay, here's a few things, and I've got this problem to solve, <clears throat> what would you suggest to start working on this problem? They look like you're about to shoot them. <laughs> they're terrified of that, but if you ask them, answer these 50 test questions, they're like, they're on it. So anyways, Education doesn't have to be about taking tests, which is supposed to be about evaluating learning, but it's not about learning anymore, it's about the tests. But bureaucrats like that. But now some bureaucrats in high places in many countries around the world are actually pushing for real education and project-based learning really works. So making that part of your education is good. So a lot of schools, not only in China, but all over the world are having hacker spaces as part of their education because education can look like this and it should. So hackerspaces are becoming part of schools. Again, when you explore and find things, you find projects you love and you're motivated to take a class. Like when I was in um, uh, undergrad and I was working on my music synthesizer on the side at this teeny little lab that didn't give me any credit in school, but it was a great place where a whole bunch of geeky people came together and we all helped each other with our projects, doing robots, and I was doing music synthesizer, and someone was even making a flying machine. And this is all in like the, the 1980, right? And um, we were doing innovative stuff for back then, and it was really cool whereas every other <laughs> lab was doing military stuff funded by the US military, they were doing stupid shit like missile guidance systems while we were actually doing something worthwhile. And I found that I didn't know enough in order to make really awesome, nasty noises with my synthesizer. So suddenly the digital signal processing class was something I wanted to take rather than something I had to take. That's because project-based learning is an incredible motivator, as we all know from the projects we do at our various hackerspaces or in our communities. So, um, <clears throat> and all of this that I've been talking about is why hackerspaces have grown from about 40 or so in 2007 to over 3,500. <clears throat> and this is actually an old picture from hackerspaces.org. Um, because now China is just as obliterated with little dots as Europe and North America because this guy visited a hackerspace, Chai Hua, in Shenzhen, China, and made a big media show out of it and said, this hackerspace is, is the future of China for economic development and education. And so every bureaucrat in China knows that they have to start a hackerspace in their local area. <clears throat> but <laughs> they don't know what hackerspaces are, so they're building spaces that look like this. They're empty co-working spaces <laughs> and they think that if they build a thing that looks like it belongs in Silicon Valley or what they believe think that it looks like something from Silicon Valley because they've never been to Silicon Valley but they believe they've built a building that looks Silicon Valley-ish that magic will happen just like in Silicon Valley. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Silicon Valley happened because there were a whole bunch of weirdos this is San Francisco, right? This is a place where weirdos collect. A whole bunch of weirdos in the 1970s wanted computers for their home. No one thought of weird stuff like that back then, but these people thought of it and they thought the technology was good enough and they got together. They couldn't do it on their own. They got together in community, the Homebrew Computer Club, and they figured out many ways to do it. And some of those companies still exist. One is the biggest capitalized company in the planet now. Um, because people explored and found things they loved and then helped each other 
in community to make it happen. And that's what needs to happen there. And there are cool hacker spaces there. And here's just a few pictures from some cool places. I mean, this should look familiar to all of us. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of cool stuff happening there. And these are just some of the places that I've been to recently. And, um, you know, in the Chai Hua, when, when bureaucrats make a big deal of something, there is possibility. And in China, there's a ton of money coming down from the top. Unfortunately, it's going into the hands, usually, of people who are building those stupid, empty co-working spaces. But there are a lot of people who can take that money, who care, who know, who understand, who want to help others, who can build community from the bottom up to make something cool happen. Things like this rather than this. So China does have lots of resources. There's manufacturing. If you make something and you want to share it with the world, there's places now around the world, there's places in Germany that are actually quite competitive with uh, China manufacturing now, and that's going to start happening more and more as China gets a better, a, even better economy. But still, if you're going to make 500 or more of something to share with the world, to make money or otherwise, whether it's open source or not, I mean, everything I do is open source. TB Gone, that I've made a living with for the last 13 years, me and 12 friends, a sustainable business, has, uh, is open source. And it works great that way because I want people to turn off TVs. <laughs> the more people that do it, the better. And the more excited they are, the more they talk about TV going, the more people buy my thing. How can that be bad? You know, it works great. And um, so anyways, there's open source companies in China now because it makes sense. All the copycat things, they don't call it open source, but it essentially is. They all share all the information with each other. It's all available for free online, and they share that stuff freely. You have to be able to read uh, Mandarin and talk Mandarin because that's the only language they do it in. But it's all there. It's an amazing uh, ecosystem. And... Um, um, you can find companies that treat people well, pay them well, treat the environment well, and give you good quality and good price. And the difference in price is minimal from the worst and the best companies. And Shenzhen is a pretty amazing place. This is the beginning of a video of a friend of mine uh, from Noisebridge who, in the markets in Shenzhen, built his own iPhone just by buying parts there. Um, and he has the video that went viral and like five million people have seen it. It's kind of crazy. And when he walks around Shenzhen, people point at him. And, uh, so Shenzhen has this area called Hua Chong Bay, which has everything you can imagine for electronics. And it's outrageously cheap. And it's really fun to go there. And, you know, not just LEDs and tools, but, you know, just anything and if you go there and you're even decent at haggling and struggling with hand waving trying to communicate with uh, translate programming with Mandarin and whatever language it's really fun um, but um, uh, Hua Chong Bay it's just zillions and zillions of these things this is just one corner of one floor of one building out of this whole area of town it's, it's really it's totally cool and there's all these maker festivals that are really huge it's really fun to check those out. There's all those cool hacker spaces. Um, there's schools and universities that teach people how to use CNC mill and you get to actually hands on to learn these things. It's, it's, it's in incredible what you can learn just by going there for a little while. Um, they also have some of the most amazing signs on the planet. This is like, I think my favorite. This sign is, um, bigger than this and it says this on it. Nobody knows what it means. Um, and some of the sky signs are kind of scary. <laughs> That's inside of a PCB manufacturing company. Doesn't that make you warm and fuzzy? China's not all good. Um, but stuff like that's disappearing. But stuff like this is everywhere. And there are a lot of really cool companies there, including a, a few, um, several open hardware companies. DF Robot makes all sorts of resources for people to make robots, and the owner of the company came from a hackerspace in Shanghai, Xin Chajian, and um, um, 
MakeBlock is a company that makes resources. They started with a um, uh, incubator that I'm a mentor for called Hacks, H-A-X, and um, they had a crowdfunding campaign that was successful, and now they're a really big company, and they treat their, this is their company. This is where they work every day. This is like a hacker space. It's really a fun place to be, and um, uh, Seed Studio is the first open hardware company, and um, it's, uh, they help people make even small quantities of uh, electronic projects and mechanical projects. Uh, they're a good resource. Uh, China also has a lot of really amazing artists. I don't know if you know who this guy is that I met. Uh, his name's Ai Weiwei. He was arrested and he had his head beaten in by the Chinese government. And he's not really a fan of the Chinese government anymore, even though he lives there. Um, they took his passport away, um, uh, but they gave it back. So, mixed bag with China, some things are opening up, some things are closing. Not as bad as my country, I think, but um, anyways, they've got better trains than Switzerland. <laughs> no shit. Um, so, uh, you know, they do go uh, up to 400 kilometers an hour and they can even stop. Um, and food. Everywhere you go, people eat food. That's the way, if you have any kind of dealing with any company, the first thing they do after just meeting and saying hi is they bring you to dinner and you have stuff like this. It's, and it's so cheap and so good. And everywhere in China, it's different. You know, saying Chinese food is kind of like saying European food. Um, and it's all good, it's just amazing. And I'm vegan and like it's super easy for me to get fantastic food everywhere, it's just great. Um, and there's co-working spaces that are really fun places as well as all the hacker spaces and incubators like Hacks that I'm a mentor for. There's also this website called Taobao. Hua Chong Bay, that electronics market in Shenzhen is amazing but Taobao is kind of like Amazon, sort of, but a Chinese version. You can buy absolutely anything there, and it will be delivered to your door, perhaps, oh, excuse me, perhaps the same day, but definitely the next day. Um, one time, uh, a few years ago, we saw that tablets were super cheap, and we thought they were, they were really crummy, but they're really cheap, so for like $30, um, a bunch of people ordered a few different ones to see if any of them actually work. It turns out they all do. Um, this was several years ago, and now they're even cheaper. We ordered them from Taobao, and they got, they, at 8 o'clock on uh, Saturday night, and they arrived before 8 a.m. on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> They've got this infrastructure down. Um, so, uh, but it's not just electronics, as you can see, like dresses and dish soap and uh, luggage, anything, absolutely anything, including industrial, like a big industrial crane or a, um, a, a bulldozer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll deliver it to your door. So, uh, so I have this project that you can play with it in there if you want to. It's a, a, a music synthesizer kit. And, um, <clears throat> All the parts, if I source all the parts in the United States, it costs me um, um, $12.85, I think it came out to. Um, if I do it on um, AliExpress, it's about uh, $8. But if I do it on Taobao, it's even cheaper. So you can see, um, these prices are amazingly cheap. If you do these little speakers from uh, Mouser or DigiKey, these cost $7 US, $7.30, I think. Uh, if you do it from AliExpress, it's considerably less, but if you do it from Taobao, it's 30 cents, 29 euro cents. And same with AT Mega 328, the, the microcontroller inside of Arduinos. If you buy them one, uh, uh, from the US, it's about $2.50. If you buy them from AliExpress, it's less. If you buy them from Taobao, it's 37 cents. You know, and you do the whole thing. And also there's PC board places. This is an open hardware company started by Dangerous Prototypes, who became famous for doing a thing called Bus Pirate. But uh, Ian um, uh, went to China to do stuff and work with Seed Studio who sold Bus Pirate. There he met his boyfriend and they've been living there ever since and they've started all these different resources for people including really cheap PCBs that you can order anywhere in the world. Dirty PCB is just one resource that does that. Seed Studio does it and so do others. Um, but using these kind of resources, you can see the um, difference in prices. <laughs> 
between sourcing things in US or AliExpress or the cheapest Taobao. And when I was in China, I got my next batch there so I can make hopefully my next um, versions of the uh, music synthes synthesizer kit cheaper f so that other people can afford it. Um, to make all of this, uh, you know, I've been going to China every year because of manufacturing. Um, and when I saw that uh, Bunny Huang, who's this amazing engineer, hacker, who um, uh, first um, hacked the um, uh, um, Microsoft uh, Xbox, yeah, the Xbox. Uh, he became super famous for that. And he does all this manufacturing, does consulting for people. He goes to China all the time and does stuff. He thought it'd be cool to uh, offer a trip to China and a bunch of people I know went on that trip and they really loved it and I thought I would do the same thing. He wasn't going to do anymore. So I started um, Hacker Trips to China. And the first Hacker Trip to China was in 2009. There were no hacker spaces in China and I was just beginning to give talks like I was talking about, um, about all this stuff. And um, but we had a great time visiting manufacturers and Hua Chong Bay, the electronics market and other things that are of geeky interest. And then meeting geeky people who would show us what they love about their hometowns wherever we go. And, um, but it grew uh, in popularity and then I met this guy, he's a professor at Tsinghua University, the one I mentioned earlier. And he's holding this sign up at Beijing International Airport for us. And, uh, and he's saying, I hope this doesn't get too um, popular a picture because I might get in trouble. But by now, the, the, the head of state, Premier Lee, is talking about hackers' faces, so he won't get in trouble. He'll get a feather in his cap. But uh, we took this funny picture of the first hacker trip and um, wearing Mongolian hats with red stars on them and uh, at a temple. Um, and you can visit... Uh, manufacturers, they, if you, all you have to do is contact them and say, can we visit? They say, sure, wear these bunny suits and you can come in. And, um, and it's, it's fun. So, um, you know, and then giving talks at schools, we, if people who want to on the trip can share their enthusiasm for their weird projects and show that if you do something, it's not because you're guaranteed to make money and you're guaranteed to succeed and all this high status stuff that people strive for. You do it because it's enjoyable. And then maybe if you want to, then you can try something and maybe it'll have some possibility of success. But you have to start by exploring. And so we're sharing with all this. And this was um, last year uh, at, um, uh, uh, what's the name of the place? Oh yeah, Zhangzhou High School number two. 20,000 students. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so we were talking to all these 20,000 students and, um, and they know English there. It's amazing. These little kids, um, well not so little, high school kids, um, know English. And um, uh, they were into it. They totally loved it. And uh, I have no idea what Zhangzhou High School number one is, <laughs> but the principal of this school has been pushing for project-based learning and wants to get away from tests. He's been pushing this and he's got the uh, friend of his in um, the Ministry of Education for this area of China. And they're pushing for this. It's really difficult though because students, before they were students, well if they were ever before students, because parents, before the kid's even born, is planning the kid's life out. Getting them into the best kindergarten, to get into the best school, et cetera, et cetera, to the best universities. You know, and this is all before they're born, so the kid only knows test, 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 test. And if you say, okay, let's take time off of these tests and actually do something worthwhile. And the kids are going, uh, yeah, this is fun, but uh, what about the tests? And, um, and they tell their parents, and the parents are like, what about the tests? So um, it's a problem. It's a big problem. How do we shift that? So we had a meeting there, and uh, they invited us to all this, and, you know, and it leads to things that look like this, and, um, you know, and talking to lots of bureaucrats. So um, it's actually fun talking to these people. They actually do want to make a positive social change. And there are people high up in government listening to them and they want to deal with these social problems. And I think that's awesome. Like that is happening in other places. Like Luxembourg invited me to go over uh, because they want every single school, public school in Luxembourg to be project based and have hacker spaces as part of their curriculum. Of course that's easier in Luxembourg where there's a total of 43 schools. 
In China, there's something like two and a half million, if I'm remembering correctly. But um, yeah, it's 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 really amazing. So, uh, anyways, uh, just in case you're interested, I'm planning another hacker trip to China, and. Um, this is the best machine porn video I think possible. This is slow motion of a spring making machine that we visited last year. This actually, a spring is made once per second. <laughs> yeah, machine porn, it's wonderful. But anyways, if you're interested, go to noisebridge.net and search for China Trip and uh, everyone's welcome. And, um, uh, I'm also working on a hacker in residence program. Tsinghua University is helping with this uh, to a little degree, and this is the kickoff of their hacker in residency. And I um, was the first hacker in residence there, and we did this kung fu hacking thing, which was really silly but a lot of fun. And um, uh, yeah, but uh, by the end of August, I hope to have hackerinresidence.org going so that any anywhere in the world, Europe, China, North America, South America, Antarctic if there's anyone there, um, can an organization can have a free page. There's no advertising, it's just something I'm doing because I want to help spread the joy. Um, so yeah, hack, this was, we were doing it on hackerspaces.org, but it's kind of cumbersome there, but there's a lot of cool stuff there because um, it's a wiki, but having a hackerinresidence.org, you just, an organization has a about page, and then uh, they can have residency opportunity pages and they decide how people want to apply. And um, you know, you've all heard of artists in residence maybe, um, where an artist can come to a community, share their thing, mentor people, learn stuff from that community and go home or somewhere else and share what they learned and cross pollinate. It doesn't have to be just visual art though, it can be everything that we all do. And a lot of these places like Tsinghua has a huge budget, they paid me not a huge amount, but $800 a month, plus housing, plus a bicycle, plus a gym pass, plus food. So, and you know, all my expenses paid plus the 800, which goes a long way in China, and plus my expenses uh, going there and back. You know, and some places have even more budget than that. And some places, you know, it's just a little hacker space. Oh, we don't have any budget. We can't pay for your travel, but we have a desk and some tools and cool people, um, but whatever. It's up to each organization what they want to offer and what's required. At Tsinghua, the only thing I had to do was have one workshop. But of course, while I'm there, I did lots, because it was fun. And I worked on lots of my own projects while I was there too. So anyways, um, it's just sort of a little bit of what I do related to China and elsewhere. And um, I like doing this stuff because I think, um, our planet is uh, really in need of some help. Uh, people on the planet need some help. You know, how many, what percentage of people on our planet think that their life is awesome? I think very small percentage, and that's really got to change. I would love to see 100% of people on our planet feeling that their lives are amazing. Um, right now there's, you know, like, uh, 4,000 or so hackerspaces on the planet, maybe that's 100,000 people that have opportunities that they have to offer and have the benefit of this kind of community. But we need millions of these for people to be able to have these kind of opportunities. There's seven billion of us here. And um, you know, maybe through all of this, we can find means of using what or getting whatever resources we need in order to live lives that are totally amazing without spending all of our time working some job that we you know, don't like or just is okay, or even if we like it, doing it too much, whatever. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Let's explore them. Let's make opportunities for everyone. And um, anyways, that's what I want to do for as long as I'm alive. So uh, here's my contact information again, and thanks for your time. Yeah, so maybe got time for any questions if there's any or comments? <laughs> um, you talked about the government in China supporting uh, various hackerspaces, but uh, when we were, were there and went to Xinjiang, 
Shinshe Xian, I think it's called. Yeah, and they told us that they didn't want any support from the government because they would have to do things that they, that they didn't want to. And I thought it was a, a similar situation in Shenzhen DIY, although I wasn't quite sure because of the language barrier. But I, I want to ask what, what the, your take was on that, that these hackerspaces they didn't necessarily like an involve, involvement with the government. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. We were talking about that in the hackerspace design pattern discussion as well. Um, money comes with strings and there's trade-offs. So some strings are more galling than others. Um, but uh, yeah, there's definitely, like Noisebridge, we don't take any money from anybody unless there's no strings. And I mean, no, if they ask, it's like, here's a million dollars, all you have to do is put our logo on the website, we'll say no. Um, we don't need a million dollars. We already have enough the way we're doing things. Uh, uh, Xin Jian is the first hackerspace. They definitely wanted to do it on their own, especially back then when it wasn't um, supported at all. They didn't know what government officials would be like. They wanted to do things their own way. And they, if you get government money, you definitely have to uh, do things that the government wants. And it might be just filling out lots and lots and lots of forms. You know what bureaucr bureaucracy is like here? <laughs> They've been doing it for two and a half millennia. <laughs> They're good at it. <laughs> and I, I think they invented it. So, um, uh, yeah, there's lots of forms to fill out. Plus, they can say, we don't like this one thing you're doing. You need our money. Stop that one thing and we'll give you the money. Right? Or they can say, you know, what you're doing is cool, but you're not doing enough of this thing. You know, it should be up to the community what people want to do in their own community and not up to the funding source. So there are trade-offs. Um, there is some money available now for people to basically do whatever they want. There might be forms to fill out. But um, uh, there are some really cool spaces that I've visited that have started with government money and it's, it's filtered down so it's just a local bureaucrat really the only string that I'm aware of is that you have to be able to have the t CCTV, the big uh, TV network come in with the uh, bureaucrat and shaking the bureaucrat's hand while everyone in China smiles at you. So, um, but yeah, you got to be careful of that. Uh, funding sources do matter, which is why, you know, I quit helping Maker Fair when the, they took $10 million grant from the U.S. military. Because I don't want to help the U.S. military with the cool things that I do. Uh, if they want to take it, that's up to them, but I'm not going to give it to them. Um, yeah. So uh, it's important to think about these things. So thanks for asking about that. Any other questions? You talked about the cheap manufacturing and the PCB manufacturing, for example, and that there are companies that do things better and that treat their employees good and some, some do not. And my question is, as a consumer here in Europe, when, for example, ordering PCBs, which I recently did for absolutely dirt cheap, and I can't imagine anyone is getting treated fairly or paid well, how would you go about uh, choosing someone there that treats them well without actually being there? Yeah, that's really important to think about too. With PCBs, they're pretty bad all the way around. I went to the, um, so Seed Studio, uh, the guy who started that, he, he calls himself Eric, uh, as it, and um, Eric really cares about this stuff. He treats his employees really well, but they don't make their own PCBs. They make their own, uh, once they have the PCB, they can have the pick and place machine and the, all the super fancy stuff to do everything else. But they don't make their own PCBs, so they looked around and tried to find the best ones they could find, and the best one they could find was the one where that weird sign was with the eyeballs. Um, they found one better than that the next year, and we visited that one as well. But it's still, 
um, you know, if you go to a place in Europe or in, in the US, there's government agencies that are overseeing things, and even though they're underfunded, uh, the manufacturers don't want their employees to be, or the companies don't want their employees to be harmed, so they enforce people to use safety equipment. At the current uh, PCB place for Seed Studio, they have all the safety equipment there, like masks and uh, ear protection in places that are loud and other uh, eye protection but people aren't using them. And they don't force people to use them. It's easier not to use them just to do your job and then go home, uh, seemingly. It's not easier to spend some amount of time in the hospital dealing with all the problems that result from that, I imagine. But yeah, so this is a problem. So that's the best that they could find, and I don't know how to find any better ones myself, but the, um, the, the one that my manufacturer uses is basically the same as the one in uh, the Seed Studio uses, but in Shanghai rather than Shenzhen. I actually went to China to visit all these places. And um, in 2003, there was no talk about this stuff on the internet. That's when I was setting up stuff for TV Be Gone. And um, uh, I talked to a bunch over the phone and email, and a bunch told me what I wanted to hear. And when I went to visit them, Several were like black pits of despair. They were really awful. They were really awful. Um, but three were good, and I went with the one that made, um, you know, for me, uh, it was really an advantage. They made a third of all the remote controls on the planet. <laughs> so they actually helped me a lot with what I do. And um, their PCB, play, they made their own PCBs, so they, they did pretty good, and they, enforce their safety a little more than others. Uh, with the company I have now, they uh, contract that out and they are kind of like that seed one. They're, the safety stuff's there, people are well trained, they're well paid, they're treated well, but they don't enforce the safety standards. But if you don't go there, you don't know. Unless there's a network of people who are going there and looking and letting other people know, that's all you can do. So if you go with the cheapest, it doesn't mean it's the worst. Cheap doesn't, you know, there's not necessarily um, a correlation between price and quality or price and how well they teach their, uh, treat their employees. Um, so yeah, you just have to either know yourself or know people who know. And that's all we can do at this point. Cool, well, um, we're pretty much out of time anyways. There's two minutes left, but uh, hit me up, email um, here in person, <laughs> WeChat if you have it, whatever. <laughs> so thanks.